Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 10th of January, 2021. Still getting used to the new year here, but welcome to our Sound for Video session. We have a whole bunch of questions to cover. We have um, some fun, fun, fun ones today too. So let's go to our super source here. Uh, by the way, first of all, we like to say thanks to our technical director, who is Emma today. And uh, Emma is running the board and um, keeping us on track here. So first of all, I didn't switch from my uh, mix control yet. <laughs> so that's my mistake. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to our agenda. Here we go. All right. So for today, first of all, we have a... Um, there was a video from a fellow that uh, actually contacted me. He runs something called the Project Z, I think it's called. I will. I have a link for the video down in the description of the live stream here today. And uh, one of the things he was looking at is they share. They typically use large diaphragm condenser microphones on their show, and. Uh, one of the things that they were, of course, concerned about during the pandemic is how do we how do we keep these mics sanitary? And you know, of course, there are cleaning there are ways you can clean them, but you don't want to get the diaphragm damp in any way. So um, he did some research and he actually landed on the Neumann website. So for those that are not familiar with Neumann, Neumann makes some very nice high end microphones um, designed and manufactured in Germany, and uh, one of the recommendations that Neumann made actually was putting a plastic bag over your large diaphragm condenser microphone, which seemed entirely counterintuitive to me. Um, so he did some experiments, and in his video, he actually shows some of the, the impact that a very thin plastic bag over a large diaphragm condenser microphone made to the overall frequency response. And it turns out it was relatively small. So kind of an interesting one. So if you're interested in that, uh, we've got a link down in the description below. So thanks for uh it's the project z is the name of the the channel so they do some nonprofit work so definitely go take a look at that if you're interested next up we have um in our h2r gear set up here so i didn't we, we actually had a live stream last night and let's go ahead and take a look at this here first of all thanks to ike for putting this plan together. So what H2R Gear is, and I didn't know about this until Ike alerted me to it, it is an application, a web application that is currently in development. It's in the beta testing phase. And so Ike is a beta tester and he put together a plan for the overall live stream setup that we're using here today. And uh, he alerted me to this. I, I got signed up as a beta tester as well. And um, we have a collaborative plan that we we worked on, but he did the, the the bulk of the work, really. So thanks again, Ike, for putting all that together. But this just sort of outlines how we have things set up. So we're using our big rig today. And again, thanks to everyone that joined the... Um, we had kind of an informal live stream last night. It was too late for most of our friends in Europe, although there were a few that joined. <laughs> um, but what this does is it just sort of outlines, um, at least at a rough level right now, how we have everything physically interconnected. And... Um, it also gives you the ability to create a packing list. So once, if you were, for example, going to do any sort of show on the road or, you know, where you had to work at a conference or whatever, where you were doing a live stream, it'll help you identify all of the equipment that you need. And it also will identify the cables that you need. Um, so really good to put together a packing list and really kind of map out your plan ahead of time so that you're prepared for the production. And so you can see here, for example, our main camera today is a Canon C200. Um, and incidentally, this should be streaming at 4K. So if you're on a browser that supports 4K, you can put it full screen and move to 4K, and this will be a little easier to see. Um, that's coming through uh, 12G cross converter and going into the ATEM 2ME Production Studio 4K switcher. Um, likewise, we have our overhead camera today. It's the GH5 also going through one of the converters. We've got a Mac Pro we're going to use to demonstrate a plug-in here a little bit later. We've got a Mac, uh, MacBook Pro, which is the live chat that we'll use to put the live chat up on screen. And then we also have an, AirPad, uh, an iPad Air, excuse me, that we're using to show the agenda and the questions for the stream. So we've got five different input sources. And oh, we also have a MacBook that's using to control the, we're controlling the switcher with. Um, we don't have a control surface, so we're using the ATEM software control there. And then on the audio side, we are using our Allen & Heath SQ5. 
This is actually a little different here. We're not using the Shelford channel today or these secondary mics, but we are using the SR314 from Earthworks. That's what I'm talking through right now. And we also have our iPhone here to play the intro and outro music going into the stereo input. Um, then we're feeding the output from the SQ5 over to the ATEM 2 ME. &E, uh, it has two XLR inputs, so we're feeding a stereo mix at line level over into the into that and that's what we have set up on that side then so when, once you get through the switcher this macbook pro is what's controlling it so it's connected to the same ethernet network it's actually connected wirelessly so it doesn't have a cable right now um, and then out, the output from the switcher is going into a tascam vsr265 that's a hardware encoder it is connected via ethernet to the internet and it is sending the stream it is the one that's encoding the stream we're not using any sort of encoding software like obs or anything like that. Instead, this is doing that for us. We also have a monitor here. Um, this is a little headphone amplifier. It has two outputs. I will be using that during the demonstration of the plugin a little later, and Emma is using it now to monitor the entire stream here just to make sure everything is sounding okay. We also do have a monitor um, set up over here, a video monitor, I should say, um, that allows me to see what the program output is. And we also have a separate one, a multi, oh sorry, this is the multi-view monitor. This is the one that Emma's using right here. What we don't have demonstrated on the plan yet is another, I have a smaller seven inch monitor over just underneath the camera here that I'm using. And uh, that's helpful for me just to kind of see what's on the program at the moment. So that's the overall look at that. So as that works through beta, hopefully this will become available for um, a wider audience here before too much longer. It's got, it's, it's really quite good already. Um, there are a few features I think that are missing, but the John Barker over at H2R, which stands for Here to Record, he is a, an event videographer, and uh, he does live streams as well. So he's the one that's put this together. He obviously is also a software engineer. So good job on that, John, and thanks for letting us be a part of the beta to work on that. All right, now back to our agenda here. And again, thanks to Ike for helping out with that. Very much appreciated. All right, let's take a look at Rob's Zany live stream signal flow. Rob actually sent this to us last week just before the stream started, and I, and I missed it, my mistake. Um, but he's looking for a little advice from our um, little community here. Rob and Jim have a live stream that they do on YouTube, but they also produce the same show as an audio show. Uh, audio only or the podcast I should say and so Rob put together this little diagram here um, <laughs> to demonstrate their setup and wanted to get the community's feedback on how he could make something simpler and I think really what he's um, kind of I think what he needs help with in particular is that this part down here so the audio is the part that's giving him challenges um, he feels like it's not a particularly clean setup, I guess. Um, so what he's doing is, let me just kind of undo that. Let me, but, so he's got his microphone coming into a mixer during the live stream. That's represented right here. And that's going over here to OBS, which uh, then connects to Restream.io and then, of course, sends it out to YouTube. And that's also how he connects with his remote host, Jim. So that actually, in addition to live streaming to YouTube, also creates a recorded video. So that gets recorded as well. And then he uses his audio right here. Well, actually, let's get that undone here. From the mixer, um, he's recording that. And then in post over here, he takes the audio from that he recorded from his mixer and the Restream I.O. recording of Jim's audio, I believe. Oh, no. No, I take that back. He takes the audio from Jim from OBS. And those both come over here into DaVinci Resolve. And then he's able to, to combine those and do the mix and move forward from there. So I think the thing that um, is has be, been a challenge, I think, Rob, is you said the audio part here for the podcast. And I don't know if it's been a pain from the standpoint that it just takes a lot of work <laughs> because there's an additional mix you have to do in post. Um, or... If there's something about how it arrives um, there, I'm not sure what that is. But I guess my first question for you would be the restream video, which is also recording audio. 
is the quality of that substantially worse than what you're producing in DaVinci Resolve in post? Curious about that. And then, so that'd be my first choice, or my first thought is if that mix is good enough and you just really kind of need to loudness normalize it from there, that's kind of the approach I would investigate first. But I'm guessing that you found that that wasn't sufficient for whatever reason. Maybe you had some dropouts or get that kind of robotic buzzing noise every once in a while with your when you're using online voice over IP recording like Restream. And maybe you're running into some issues there. But whatever the case may be, that would be the first thing I would do is try and use that Restream audio if possible. And I think, I think you're using the... I think you're using a pro account and I... I I don't know. I, I think the audio quality is pretty decent. Like, I don't know it's going to be a whole lot better recording from OBS, but um, does Rob have any, has he said anything in the chat here yet? Okay, Rob, give us some more input if you can, but that would be my first choice and, and, and a first kind of thing I would investigate to see if you could use that restream recording and just, just use that. If that doesn't work and if there's still some problems with that, let us know. And if anyone else has other kind of input for uh, in the chat, definitely let Rob and uh, all of us know. We'd love to get your input on that. All right, very good. Let's go back to our agenda here. It looks like um, Rob. We'll wait for some more input for, on you, and and we'll we'll come back to that. But let's go ahead and jump into our question and answer here. First up, I watched your Zoom F4 video, and it has a slate tone feature. Is there a workaround for the Zoom H6 without one? Zoom says a minus 20 dB uh, tone should you should work usually. Do you agree? Yes. Minus 20 tone is a great way to do that. They also mentioned getting an attenuator cable to reduce the noise. Is that really necessary? Um, well, let's move over to our Zoom F6 here. There, there actually is a bug with the Zoom F6, and I think it's actually a hardware issue. Not 100% sure, but based on my research, it looks like it is a hardware issue. And that is that the line output works fine when you send a line level signal, but when you're working with a camera like a, um, and I don't know if you said specifically which camera you're using here, um, but if you're using a consumer grade camera with a microphone level only input, that's where things get a little bit problematic with the F6 in my, in my research. Because what happens with this line output, you have to use an attenuator, and the way you do that is you come into the menu, you come to the output menu, and then you go to the line out. And then if you go into the level, this shows you, you give a, you get an opportunity to reduce the, the output level. Whoops, let's come back up here. See, I can, I can pull that down if I need to. And typically for a mic level input, you're gonna wanna go to, you know, you're probably gonna be in the minus 35 dB range, somewhere in there. And the problem is, is that when you do that, the output starts to generate a whole lot more noise for reasons that I don't understand. And the only way we found to eliminate that was to use an attenuator cable instead of using this line out setting. So I bought a minus, I think it was a minus 25 dB attenuator, and that got us pretty close to where we needed to be, and we weren't getting the noise anymore. So it's up to you. If you're getting good enough results and you're happy with it, then that's fine. Um, you don't have to buy that, but I would recommend it if you want to get clean audio. And then also, the Zoom F6 does have a tone. Um, it doesn't have a slate, but it does have this tone that you can use right here, and that will send out a tone at minus 6 dB full scale. It's not minus 20, but that is usually enough to, you can use that to calibrate the levels, the input level on your camera to its lowest setting generally, and then I would use the line out or an attenuator cable to make up the difference until your camera is also showing minus 6 on its meters. That way you'll have the levels calibrated between the F6 and your camera, and that way, as long as you're not clipping on this, your F6, or exceeding zero dB full scale, I should say, on this, then you will not clip on your camera either, generally. So <laughs> so that's the, uh, that's the first thing I would do. Um, whoops, let's go ahead, and then you can turn the tone back off, and then you're ready to go. So that's how I would approach it. Let's jump back into your question over here. H6, not F6. Oh, he's using an H6. Oh, well, I really biffed that, didn't I? <laughs> um, okay, so let's get off of the F6. This is irrelevant entirely. Sorry about that, Hal. My bad. Um, is Yeah, you don't need an... Well, um, 
With the H6, I don't know if you will need an attenuation cable or not. No, that one doesn't have the same bug that the F6 has. So I just went down this whole path, <laughs> having read it wrong. Um, the problem is, is no, the H6 does not have a tone feature. So what I would do is I would go into your digital audio workstation and create one. Um, Audition, for example, has the ability to generate tones. So you would generate a minus 20 dB tone on a, put it on a, uh, in as a WAV file, put it on an SD card, stick it in your H6, and play it back while you have that all set up, you know, connected to your computer. And then you can use the settings on, first of all, your your camera, set the input to its lowest setting, and then adjust the output level on the H6 until you got the meter, you get the meters on the camera also at minus 20 dB. Okay. So thanks for straightening us out. Thanks, Emma, for catching that uh, difference there. And it looks like someone probably put that in the chat. Okay. All right, good. Thanks, everybody. Um, also, Hal says at the bottom, to confirm if I have two channels going into the Zoom, I should really record into the Zoom and line up everything with pluralized so I have all the channels. No work around there. Actually, that's not true. If you do have, If you just have two channels, there is, well... I don't know about, again, the H6. I don't have an H6 here. I apologize. But if you have the ability to pan the channels, uh, the inputs on the H6, pan one hard left, pan the other one hard right, and then that way, as it comes out of the F6, it will put one channel on the left channel, or one input on the left channel on your camera, and the other on the right channel on your camera, and then you have the ability to mix that in post if you need to. So, but if you're doing, if you're doing, a live to tape as we call it like you're doing a zoom meeting plus you want to do post-production on it then yeah you're going to need to record it in your h6 and then do the post work from there okay thanks for straightening us out everybody and we will move on to the next one what yeah, i'm getting a signal rob's back rob's back rob does rob have input for us uh -huh. okay let's go back to rob's little diagram here and what's rob's input Restream audio. Jim uses a Blue Yeti, which can be really hot. With Restream, both my audio and his are mixed already, which makes it very hard to have an even loudness. Okay, so you do need to um, work on that a little bit. Restream audio, which is why I wanted separate audio tracks. I can EQ loudness, normalize separately, then mix. Much better result. Okay, that's fair. I... I don't see an obvious way to change this process unless you're unless you don't like DaVinci Resolve's <laughs> Fairlight and you're struggling with that, and that may be the case. But um, I really don't see a, another better way around that, unfortunately. Anyone else in the chat have input? I only aspire to be on Rob's Zany live stream, part of Rob's Zany live stream signal flow at some point in the future. Rob, I hope. May I please? I hope I can. <laughs> so. Thanks for that. Okay. Thanks, Hal, for your question as well. Let's go to Joe's question. I saw Joe here earlier today. Joe, thanks for joining us and for sending in your question. Um, first up, I tr uh, try like your comments on two items. I'm going to try the next pistol shooting range. So Joe is a pistol shooting enthusiast and does a lot of recording of those. And number one, try a Tentacle Sync 32-bit pocket recorder to better cover the dynamic range between my voice and a gunshot during the shed under the shed roof. So the shed is where you shoot from. <clears throat> I understand mic overload will still be a problem. My current practice is simply to bring the clipped and distorted peaks down to something tolerable compared to the voice level in the recording. So it sounds like you're using that recorder for both your voice and your gun. And in that case, yeah, I guess that's what you're going to have to do. I mean, that's one one option. Now, you, you may or may not have seen the live stream we did with Watson Wu probably four weeks ago. Um, Watson records a lot of guns, a lot of firearms, and his recommendations, and he's actually, um, he uses a Sound Devices, I think it was a 788, I think he said, but he, he, he puts the limiters on and he intentionally clips the gunshot audio. Um, but you're doing something kind of different here. You're trying to record both dialogue and the gun in the same thing so yeah i think maybe a tentacle sync would be a good choice and then that way in post you can kind of figure out where you want each of them to sit so that's probably a fine choice there all right number two use a separate recorder mic located 20 to 30 20 to 30 feet downrange and out from under the shed roof to record the gunshots hoping to eliminate the mic overload from being too close to the discharge the mic and recorder placement should also help minimize pickup 
uh, of the shed roof reflections, even a conventional recorder and a normal microphone should work here, giving enough distance from the shed to eliminate mic overload. Yeah, I would think so. Completely agree. And that way you've got some interesting coverage as well. And, and probably once you get out there, I don't know how much time you have to spend. Um, and I don't know, you know, you might be able to try and experiment with a various placements of that microphone facing the shed, facing away from the shed. Um, you know, I don't know if, what kind of microphone you're going to use there, whether it's an omnidirectional or a cardioid. But I think you'll get a different effect depending on how that microphone is aimed if you are using any sort of directional microphone. So definitely worth experimenting there as well. Um, continuing on, I would still use a small pocket recorder for the real-time dialogue, but in post, cut over to the gunshot recorder for a softer, cleaner gunshot sound without the distortion and clipping I get when recording under the shed at the bench. Depending on the distance from the shed, I can slide the gunshot audio a few frames so that the gun just discharge audio lines up with the visual gun movement and may try a second recorder this week. Won't have the tentacle sync recorder. Okay, yeah, I think that all sounds like a, a good approach. Definitely, Joe. Um, but also take a look if you haven't listened to Watson Wu um, before. We didn't get a lot into firearms in that live stream. We're hoping to do another one where we talk more firearms, but he talked a lot about audio for cars or recording cars. And um, But one of the things he did say about gunshots is he actually intentionally clips them because it gives him more impact. But of course, he's recording for video games and movies where you want something that sounds a little more dramatic. So I'm not sure what kind of sound you're going for, but that's one thought he did have. So thanks, Joe. Appreciate that. And good luck on your record. It's like the ATEM Mini, but also some really basic ABC hardware switches, which obviously cost a lot less. I'm fully aware that switchers like the ATEM give me more options than simply choosing and routing multiple inputs. What would be the result if I tried to use a simple ABC switcher in a live stream? I think I know, but would like to have a definitive definitive answer rather than my semi-intelligent guesses. Well, um, yeah, I think the problem is that I've seen on those uh, HDMI switchers that you're talking about, they're generally made to put at your TV to be able to switch between various inputs. Like, for example, if you have a cable box or a gaming console or maybe a Blu-ray player, it's, it's made to switch between those. The problem with most of those is that... The, all of the HDMI input inputs do not stay active the entire time that's on. They're usually passive converters or switchers. And so what that means is if you were to use that for a live stream, if you switched from A to B, there would be a period of time when the HDMI signals were negotiating. And so you would have no signal for a period of seconds. In some of them, it's like 10 seconds. In some of them, it's just a couple seconds. But that would be the big problem that I've seen with those types of switchers. So you really want something that's going to be, that's made for live streaming. Um, so I don't know if that's in line with what you were guessing, but that's um, that's been my experience with those. And maybe someone has or knows of an, a simple ABC type switcher that switches very quickly. Uh, maybe there are some of those out there. I'm not sure. So thanks, Mike, for that question. Next up from Joel. All right, let's go back to the questions here. It's not coordinated properly. I'm not seeing that. Um, okay, looks like we lost our connection between the iPad and the switcher. I may have bumped a cable here, so we're going to fix that. No, it's just dark. Stand by. There we go. Okay, now we're back over. <laughs> oh, using consumer devices for things like this with HDMI cables can be interesting. This one's tiny. Um, bear with me. I'm going to go ahead and read through it. So, um, But if you do have a 4K stream, go full screen. This will help. I have some Rode NT5 mics and have tried booming one of these above in the shot. This gives great quality, uh, but picks up more echo in the room. It's an untreated room than a wireless go due to proximity effects or lack thereof. I'm considering putting both Rode NT5s on a wide stereo bar on the end of a boom above her, the talent, to give better proximity when she's moving around and also treating the room to reduce reverb. This might negate the need for the wireless go, and I agree. Here's the thing, with the, the NT5 as a cardioid microphone, you're gonna have to get that in pretty close to help manage room noise and ambience. So that's one thing, it's not the most directional mic, that's why a lot of times um, on the professional productions, they'll typically use super cardioids when they're working indoors like that. Even then, if you've got a really live room, you're still gonna pick up some of that room ambience. 
Uh, let's see here. He says, I record the NT5s through a Tascam Model 16 mixer multi-track recorder and line up the audio from these manually with the MP4 in Audition with, simple, with a simple hand clap. We do one long take of up to 30 to 40 minutes given we're just recording the live stream or the live session. In Audition, in post, despite lining up the hand clap and the initial audio sounding in line between the audio captured in the MP4 from OBS from the Wireless Go, and the audio captured on the multi-track NT5, after 15 minutes or so, it is audibly out. I'm saying, I'm thinking out of sync is what you mean. Yeah, throwing the lip sync out. And by 30 minutes, it is unusable. Writing this has reminded me I've not tried lining these up in Final Cut Pro, but I'll kick myself if it's just a newbie audition error. <laughs> audio is recorded in 44.1 kilohertz. Um, okay. You can probably record in 48 kilohertz. Your camera's probably doing that. Um, I don't know if that really would affect sync necessarily, but that, that is one thought there. One of your videos suggests avoiding drift by recording smaller snippets of video. Not possible in this case. Understood. What should I be doing? Some kind of warping lining up hand claps at both start and end of the recording to slightly stretch shrink the NT5 audio by the request number of frames? A required number of frames? Or is this setup too simple to be getting good results here? Should I be investing in time code, aware cameras and audio recorders? Any advice on a spectrum from cheap and dirty hack to what the pros would do? Money no object would be amazingly well appreciated. All right, let's talk about that for a little bit. Uh, the main thing that I would consider doing is feeding the audio directly from the Tascam into your camera during the live stream and then recording it there as well. Um, it sounds like you're using two different sets of microphones. I would get the mic, or, you know, the, get the sound to the point where you, you're you happy with it, both during the live stream and post, if you can, um, and just using the one mic. I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know why you'd use a stereo mic if it's just talking head, because then you're just going to pick up more room ambiance, um, unless you're intentionally trying to do that, but it sounds like you're not. So I would go down to one NT5, or at least just use one NT5 live at any given time and cut over to the other one if you have to. Maybe use it as a backup. Um, that'd be my first thought, first uh, couple of thoughts. If for whatever reason you don't feel like you can run the audio from the Tascam into your camera, um, in Audition there is a time stretch tool. It can potentially change the pitch, but I think it corrects for that. So um, take a look at that as well. And I'm assuming that after 30 minutes, you're probably something like four, maybe four frames out of sync. Stretching it that much shouldn't cause any major pitch issues, even if it doesn't compensate for that. But I believe it does compensate for that. So it's in the um, whatever that audio panel is called. <laughs> I don't even know what it's called. Let me just pull it up here really quickly. It is called the... I never use it. Essential sound panel. So um, I believe it does have a time stretch option there. So you can just stretch it. And yeah, I would also do a clap at the end just to help kind of confirm that you've got things set right. So Joel, thanks for that question. And Joel also has a second question. Let's move to that now. Uh, number two, uh, try to set her speech, shouting instructions and encouragement at her audience over the music. Um, so I, I think he's doing, I, if I had to guess, is some sort of exercise kind of program. For live, I use a sidechain compressor in OBS, ducking the music slightly when her mic hits a threshold. In post, I take the clean mic and the music tracks I've recorded and have been using the essential sound ducking feature in Audition. This is obviously just automation instead of sidechain side compression, but seems to give a reasonable result. Could you comment on which of these two approaches you think is a better option in your experience? Well, they're doing, in the end, the exact same thing. And in fact, I think that the ducking feature in Audition is basically a sidechain compressor. Or something very, very close to it. So they're, you know, whatever sounds better, use your ears. Whichever one sounds better is the one you should use. If it's, um, if it sounds good enough with what you have set up in OBS, then just go with that. Just make your, your process simple. If you can do that, if it sounds better using the ducking feature in Audition, well then probably stick with that. I don't have a strong opinion on either one of those, but I think in the end, they're generally doing the same thing. One may be moving a fader down, you know, doing automation as you suggest. The other one might actually be compressing and just affecting stuff beyond or above a certain threshold, which in that case, probably the ducking feature is probably a better approach. Um, but overall, th those are my thoughts on that. So Joel, thanks for those questions. Okay, next up from Timothy. 
And Timothy, I don't have a recommendation for you, but his question is this. Do you have any recommendations or best practices to sing along a backing track on video? I've tried a couple of different ways, but have resorted to lip syncing, which doesn't feel right. Um, and I don't, I don't know if we have the full context of what you're doing here. Are you, are you just recording your video to match up with a pre-recorded audio track? And if that's the case, then yeah, go ahead and sing out. I don't think that's going to hurt the video. Just drop the video's audio at the end and, and sync it up to the pre-recorded track if that's what you want to do. Um, lip syncing, <laughs> I don't I don't really sing, certainly not on camera. So uh, I don't have any other tips, but certainly there are a lot of musicians out in our audience there, so hopefully they can have some additional input for you as well. Thanks, Timothy. All right, Ali, I read that Isotope RX is not compatible with the new MacBook Pro M1. Do you rec recommend waiting for the update with compatibility or just buy it? Well, um... Well, if you need to use it right away and you're on a MacBook Pro M1, um, there was a website I found, and I'll, I'll go see if I can find it now. Close Safari. Um, let me see if I can find it, but Mac M1 compatibility. Is Apple Silicon ready? Yeah, let's go ahead and switch over to this. All right, for music, let's see. Is Isotope not under here? Isotope might be under video production. Hmm. Am I missing it? I thought I saw it listed here. Well, let's search. Doesn't have it on this list anymore. Okay, so I'm not sure what the story is on that, but um, it. my understanding is that it can run in Rosetta, if I'm not mistaken. Um, go ch or, or you could contact Isotope Support just to confirm. Um, that's probably your best bet. Isotope is fantastic. I'm sure they're going to support M1 at some point. Um, I don't know all that's involved in making that. I mean, if you listen to the Apple keynote, it's merely a, an issue of recompiling for M1, but uh, that's clearly not always true. Um, nevertheless, I think they're working on it. So you'll probably want to contact Isotope support to get the, um, the you know, all the details on where they're at right now, whether it can work. It, it might be able to run in Rosetta 2 right now. I'm not sure. But it may not just be optimized for M1 yet, so it wouldn't have the... Uh, whatever the binaries are called that have both Intel and M1 code in them, whatever those are called. Um, so that's that's what I would do. So thanks for that, Ali. Best wishes. And yeah, Isotope is... I, I think you're going to like RX a lot. All right, next up from James. How is your cart project coming along? I'm sad to report it's on hold. Um, and I, I'm not in a position where I can take any, you know, projects right now outside of the house. So I'm just working on the kind of the remote projects I do for my day job and then anything we do here at Light and Sound Media or Learn Light and Sound, I should say. So on hold for now, but thanks for asking. All right, next up from Steve. Uh, Steve says, my question has to do with mixing audio in post and embedding the time code that was recorded onto a track. I recently did a multi-track record with three cameras. I thought I was smart in sending time code from my F6 to all my cams and onto an audio track into my DAW. Was able to use Tentacle Sync software to sync up my three cameras and the live two-track mix with the embedded audio on the F6. Worked great. I went back to remix the multi-track audio in my DAW, Digital Performer. Great DAW with a lot of time code options to be either a slave or master. I re realized that at mix down, I had no way to embed that time code from the audio track into a bounce down. Other that, than using my F6 as an external recorder like a DAT or CD recorder, playing my remix DAW files in real time and having the X F6 slave 
the recorded time code track. Is there a way to embed the time code to my new mixed audio while doing a bounce down? Um, do you know Emma? I don't use time code. So I no, she doesn't use time code, so she doesn't know. I don't know Steve with, I, I don't know um, performer. I'm not, I don't, I haven't used digital performer, so I don't know for sure. But usually time code is just embedded as a metadata stamp, time stamp, and, but it sounds like you're trying to keep it as a separate audio track. Um, and I don't know how you do that in a bounce down. I would assume that everything that gets bounced out of digital performer is stereo, but, but I don't really know. And I don't really understand. I think the context here, if I had to guess, you're trying to do music videos. So if that is the case, and again, I'm just guessing here, um, let's go over to our Mac here and let me just show you something. Um, because we've had this question come up a number of times before, but if you are trying to do music video playback with time code, um, here is uh, what looks like a pretty decent resource to look into. They have a little video here, and they also kind of run through their entire setup, both in terms of what they run on the computer. Um, and, and yeah, in fact, that could be the answer to one of your questions is, you know, if you didn't want to use your F6 as an external recorder, and then also playing your DAW files from your computer, so on and so forth. I think that's what they're doing here. And they're also using um, some sort of IFB to send... The information but anyway this is i'm not going to go into all the details here but this is one worth looking at we'll put that link in the description down below after the stream here as well all right we have another question here this one from so thanks for that steve lewin uh just got my mix pre 62 and removing xlr cables from the recorder is sometimes a challenge is this something common are you aware of a solution um, i haven't had that problem with my copies of the mix pre and i'm on i have Actually, I have three of them currently. I had one, another one before. I had a Mix Pre 6 first generation before. Um, what I can say is all of the cables that I use, and this will come up in the next question as well, are cables that are terminated with Neutrik connectors. And I have never had a problem with the Neutrik connectors getting stuck either in the Mix Pre, in any of my Zoom recorders. And one recorder in the past that has had a lot of issues with, <laughs> with people getting things, uh, cables stuck is the Tascam uh dr60d mark ii i've never had any of my cables get stuck in that either so i think i don't know what kind of connectors you're using on your cables but um, i've had very good luck with the neutric connectors so if anyone else has had experience with that let us know in the chat definitely and then number two i want to start doing covers using my mix pre as the recorder what would be the best setup to get monitors for those performing four people max I would definitely look into a headphone amplifier. So you'd feed the audio out of the MixPre's headphone amp into a headphone amplifier. And then, you know, with four outputs. And I, there are a variety of companies that make them a, a pretty easy way to uh, to find some of those. Is you could definitely find some at Sweetwater. B&H would probably also have some as well. I don't have a specific one that I would recommend. We're using one here today, the Little Labs monitor. But that's a really expensive one and it only has two outputs. So it wouldn't fit... Um, the fact that it only has two outputs wouldn't fit your particular use case. Um, by the way, I highly recommend this headphone monitor. It's amazing. Um, it's big, it's clunky, it's simple, and it's beautiful. So it does a good job. All right, next question is from Keenan. Let's take a look at that. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about connectors. I recently purchased a Deity S Mic 2 and some XLR cables with Amphimol amphenol connectors connecting these xlr cables with amphenol connectors proved to be a big issue as they fit too tightly into the mic getting them out required some pretty aggressive shaking of the connectors i had to buy another set of cables with rockstone connectors which fit perfectly instead i had a similar issue before with my mkh416 and other connectors this makes buying cables online a complete no-go for me as i never know if they fit just right or too tightly I wonder if there are actual design differences that make these connectors so hard to work with, and if there's a way to know without testing all the time which cables fit which mics or which cables fit which cables. Would really like to hear your thoughts on the matter. I'm very thankful that you do these sessions, as they are always incredibly helpful and informative. Looking forward to the next. So, Keenan, um, as I mentioned before, I, I all of my cables I work with um i have them custom made so i had some custom made by my friend alan williams who is at sound speeds and um he he, he uses also neutric connectors on all of those cables and then 
Um, I've also had a lot of custom cables made here by a local pro audio shop called Performance Audio. And again, each time I buy those, I specify Neutrik connectors, and I have never had an issue with those. Emma also, in her experience with the cables she's used, has always had Neutrik connectors and never had an issue. So if anyone has a different experience out there, please let us know in the chat. But those have been, that's been our experience here with the Neutrik connectors. All right, that is everything for the question and answer. So let's go ahead and head on back over to our, um, actually our agenda doesn't have this on there, but let's head on over to Adobe Audition. I wanna show you something here with um, Adobe Audition. This is a new plugin, and it's not a new plugin, it's an old plugin actually, it's new to me, and it's called Soothe2. And the reason we've brought up Soothe, well, this company actually contacted me and said, hey, we're kind of big in the music world, <laughs> but we're not so big in the film world, in the video world, and wanted to see if you wanted to try out our plugins. And so Soothe 2 is the one I definitely heard of. It's, it is very common in the music world. Um, I think initially the, the initial idea was that it would be good for vocals in particular, but I think a lot of mixers are using it for more than just vocals. Um, in our case, we're going to use it for dialogue here. And let me just kind of run through something here. So here's a really interesting recording of my voice. And I'm using my voice, and I apologize for that in advance because it's a little bit tricky to do a kind of a demonstration when you're also using a recording of your own voice. So I realize the, the issues with that. But the reason I wanted to use this particular recording is that it sounds absolutely horrible. And it is me being recorded through a Sankin Cost 11D, which is a actually very high quality lavalier microphone. But the characteristics of my voice and the characteristics of that microphone are, are a horrible match for each other. And I always end up doing a significant amount of EQ to make it sound decent. Let me just play through a little bit of this. So let's switch over to the uh, Mac here. Here's another recording. In this case, I think a really good example of what a microphone voice combination sounds like that doesn't match. <laughs> this is my voice on the Senken Kos 11D. Great microphone used in tons of movies and television shows. Sounds great on a lot of people's voices, just doesn't sound great on mine, but... Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> um, that's pretty nasty. So let's just go ahead and pull up Soothe 2 here and show you what it is. So first of all, let me kind of describe that from my perspective and what I found so far, what it does. Um, I think essentially what this is, is it's a kind of purpose-built dynamic equalizer that automatically or attempts to automatically go out and find the resonances in your recording and add dynamic EQ cuts to the kind of the bad spots, the parts that are sounding not so good. So, um, <clears throat> This is the default set of settings here, but let me just kind of flatten this out for now. Um, we have a few controls here. We have depth, and we'll, we'll take a look at that here um, in detail kind of as we start running through it. We have our soft and hard controls, so they're basically like how, how um, aggressive do you want Soothe 2 to be? We also have sharpness, selectivity. We're going to kind of just play through all of those as we're kind of running through the audio here. So the idea is that it should find these nasty resonances in my voice and make them sound better. Let me actually, before I do that, let me just go ahead and put a regular old parametric equalizer on here. Oh, I must've been doing something pretty extreme back then. I don't remember what that was. We'll reset that. I'm gonna go ahead and drop a high pass and a low pass on. Um, we can probably bump the low pass, or sorry, the high pass up to 60 Hertz. And I, you know, there's the traditional method of Grabbing a point here, for example, this point number three, which is right here. Um, we're going to tighten that up. Let's tighten up the cue. So we got this little spike thing. And what I would do is kind of as I'm playing the audio, I drag it back and forth and find those resonances. Um, it'll start to sound really, really nasty. So in fact, let's go ahead. and I usually also put that at about 9 dB and then sweep it. If you go beyond that, everything is going to sound horrible. If you go below that, it can be hard to detect what you're looking for, but that's generally what I'm finding. Um, but let's go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and sweep through those and let's see if we can find some resonances that sound really nasty and see what happens when we cut those. So I'm not going to talk for a bit. Here it goes. Recording. Uh, here's another recording. In this case, I think a really good example of what a 
microphone voice combination sounds like that doesn't match. <laughs> this is my voice on the Senken Cos 11D. Great microphone used in tons of movies and television shows. Sounds great on a lot of people's voices, just doesn't sound great on mine. But not everything is lost because that's where equalization in post comes in. So I'm giving you an audio sample here that we can use to show you how I would approach EQing this to make it sound a lot better. Here's another recording. Uh, here's another recording. In this case, I think a really good example of what a microphone voice combination sounds like that doesn't match. <laughs> this is my voice on the Senken Cos 11D. Great microphone. Let's turn it off. Used in tons of movies and television shows. Back on. Sounds great on a lot of people's voices. Just doesn't sound great on mine. But not everything is lost because that's where... E Okay, so that's kind of just a really crude way of helping things sound a little bit better, kind of capturing some of those resonances and mellowing them out a little bit. And you can see we had one here right around a kilohertz and another one around two kilohertz. There's probably more we could do as well, but that really kind of helped it sound a lot smoother, a little bit more natural. So that's one way of doing things. I'm going to go ahead and turn that off and let's get rid of this plug in here. All right, let's bring up Soothe 2 and see what we get there. Okay, so this is new to me, so I have not used this a whole lot. Just a little bit of experimenting with it, but um, let's play through it and see what it does. Recording, uh, here's another recording. In this case, I think a really good example of what a microphone voice combination sounds like that doesn't match. <laughs> this is my voice on the Senken Cos 11D. Great microphone used in tons of movies and television shows. Sounds great on a lot of people's voices, just doesn't sound great on mine. But not everything is lost because that's where equalization in post comes in. So I'm giving you an audio sample here that we can use to show you how I would approach EQing this to make it sound a lot better. Here's another recording. Uh, Here's another recording. In this case, I think a really good example of what a microphone voice combination sounds like that doesn't match. <laughs> this is my voice on the Senken Cos 11D. Great microphone, used in tons of movies and television shows. Sounds great on a lot of people's voices, just doesn't sound great on mine. But not everything is lost because that's where equalization in post comes in. So I'm giving you an audio sample here that we can use to show you how I would approach EQing this to make it sound a lot better. Here's another recording. Uh, here's another recording. In this case, I think a really good example of what a microphone voice combination sounds like that doesn't match. <laughs> this is my voice on the Senken Cos 11D. Great microphone used in tons of movies and television shows. Sounds great on a lot of people's voices, just doesn't sound great on mine. But not everything is lost because that's where equalization in post comes in. So I'm giving you an audio sample here that we can use to show you how I would approach EQing this to make it sound a lot better. Here's another recording. Uh, here's another recording. In this case, I think a really good example of what a microphone voice combination sounds like that doesn't match. <laughs> this is my voice on the Senken Cos 11D. Great microphone used in tons of movies and television shows. Okay, I'll stop there for now. So you can see what it's doing here. It's essentially, it's not only uh, taking out some of those resonances, it's also, um, I think it's doing some DSing as well, um, which is kind of interesting. And I'm not entirely clear. I'm going to have to do some more tutorials here to see how, you know, how all of this works here. But I think this is basically the range. You're telling it here the range that you want it to affect to work on um, is my understanding of how that works. So you can create a curve here. So if you may not want it to affect certain frequencies, you can tell it, you know, just don't mess with those. We'll take care of those in other, you know, plugins or effects or whatever. Um, 
So you can also have a lot of um, additional, you know, like if you select one of these points, you can change the parameters just for that individual point. Um, so you can change the Q or the width, if you will. Um, so that's pretty interesting. It's a, it kind of, in a lot of ways, it is a, I think the idea here is to make it so that you can very quickly process dialogue audio without having to do a de-esser and an EQ and, you know, whatever else you need to do to kind of get it to a point where you feel like it's ready to go into a mix and uh, mix with some other uh, dialogue tracks and sound effects and sign to sound elements and so on and so forth. So we'll get a closer look at that over time here. I just got the copy of that just late this last week here and I uh, wanted to show what kind of is possible here with Soothe 2 and... Uh, why it's popular in the music world it looks like it it looks like a pretty good tool i don't know have you used it on any of yours emma has not used it i've heard people liking it though yeah a lot of people talk about it and um and like working with it so anyway so we'll take a closer look at that as time goes on all right we have a few minutes let's go to the chat and see if we have anything that we need to talk about in the chat if i completely did i bungle anything else up answer the wrong question <laughs> um you have an expensive voice. Would the DPA 4060 be better for you? Um, <laughs> actually, the 4060, um, I have the... Which one is it that I have? I think it is the... I think it's the 4160 is the lav mic that I have in my kit. Um, it's the one that's kind of... The reason I have that in my kit is for the corporate video. A lot of times people, I've got talent wearing button-down shirts... And that one's uh, got this kind of forward-facing capsule as opposed to the the one that's uh, in a tube facing up or a cylinder facing up. Um, and that's easier to hide under button-down shirts without having to dig underneath people's clothing. Um, too far, at least. <laughs> and that one doesn't actually sound that great on my voice either. It's a I have a lot of this kind of mid-range frequency or mid-range resonance that, that just doesn't fit great. Nothing that EQ can't help fix a little bit. And in fact... Um, the, if you, if we go over here to the iPad real quick, Emma, um, you can see here, for example, we were working on this last night. So you can see this is the, this is the EQ curve we have currently applied to my voice while talking through the Earthworks SR314. Um, and I, I don't know, I guess you're probably, my guess is you're probably joking about that expensive voice thing. So, um, <laughs> Um, the 4060, I haven't tried the 4060, 4160 does have that, does pick up on a lot of that mid-rangey stuff. My experience with DPA microphones is that they try to be, they try to aim for a pretty neutral sound. They're not generally doing a lot of bass boost. Like, for example, I think, I feel like my Sennheiser MKH8050 um, emphasizes bass a little bit more than the DPA 4017B, and certainly more than the, the Lavalier microphones. I almost feel like they've voiced those so that you put them right on the middle of the chest and they won't pick up a whole lot of the chest resonance or not emphasize it too much. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Voicing a lavalier microphone is tricky business because you can put it, every time you move it just an inch or a couple of centimeters, it's going to sound different just because the sound that's right next to the microphone is so different um, just moving it around the body. And so my, my general sense is that that's what DPA has kind of assumed that in most cases it's going to be here on the chest. And so they kind of seem to roll off some of those lows a little bit so you don't get a lot of chest resonance. Um, anyway, cool. All right. Well, the, the first thing is if you have a really poor acoustical environment, it's something that's not been treated. You've got lots of reverberation, lots of sounds slapping off the wall and fluttering around in the room. That's where I feel like a dynamic mic is going to help a lot of people. Dynamic mics, you generally have to work up a little bit closer on them, and just by that very, by virtue of that fact, um, you're going to get a lot more signal and a lot less noise. So you're going to just get a better recording, a more isolated recording generally. Um, so a lot of people that are starting their podcast, if I ask them, you know, what, what kind of space you're recording, and if you go walk around that space and you clap, are you hearing a lot of reflections, a lot of um, reverberation? And if they say yes, I say, well, you probably want to stick with a dynamic microphone unless you're going to have some way to treat that space for when you're doing your recording. So that's generally my recommendation. The problem with dynamic microphones, and it's not necessarily a problem, but it, it may not be the sound you want. If you want something that's more detailed, um, that's where a condenser mic is going to be a better fit, most likely. Um, and some of the dynamic microphones have attempted to address that. I think the Electrovoice RE20 has a lot more high-frequency content 
than other dynamic microphones. Um, so if that fits your voice, that can be a good option as well. Um, that microphone's interesting too from the standpoint that it also helps manage proximity effects. So if you do get up really close on the microphone, um, it's not going to uh, change its timbre in a, in a massive way. It's not going to get a whole bunch of that really low frequency richness necessarily. It's going to sound a little more even. Um, so that's, that's my general thinking on that. Now, large diaphragm condensers are interesting too. They, you know, large versus small diaphragm condensers, there's some differences there as well. I think from an engineering standpoint, it's generally easier to engineer and voice a small diaphragm condenser microphone that will sound more natural um, in the part of the pattern where the where it's not ex, you know, where it's not picking up as much sound. Um, so it won't change the frequency response as much when it gets off axis generally. Um, but that doesn't always hold true. I think large diaphragm condensers have a tendency to, I, from my understanding, it's a little bit harder to engineer them so that they sound um, as natural off axis as they do on axis, which can color, you know, whatever off axis sound you may have. So I, but the short answer to your question really is for podcasting specifically, almost always the goal is you don't want a lot of extraneous noise. You want the sound of the voices and that's really it. Um, so in those cases, again, if you're in an, un, you know, an untreated acoustic space, I'd go with a dynamic generally. And then if you do have a better acoustic space, um, I think a condenser, large diaphragm condenser can be a great choice. So, all right. Thanks, Greg. Which co foam cover fits your SR314? I can look that up. It's a sure foam cover. Um, and I'd need to get over here. Let's take a look. I think I ordered that from B&H some time ago, so I'll just pull up my orders here. This is kind of funny. <laughs> um, oh, it's making me log in. Sorry for the wait, folks. Okay, let's see if that gets us in here to our orders. I can give you the exact model number here in just a moment. Uh, here we go. Oh, I'm going to have to go to the second page, load more. I've ordered an awful lot of things. Huh, it's not showing it. It is a Sure Foam cover, and it's made for their microphones. I'm not seeing it, strangely. For whatever reason, it's not showing up on my order history. Um, it is, uh, did I order it from Amazon? What? Sure. Oh, there it is. Okay. Peter got it. <laughs> That's probably the one. The A85WS. Um, yeah, I'm going to guess you're probably right on that. So thank you. That's what I love about this community. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, yeah, so I don't know, uh, beyond that, but I, but yeah, it, it it's not a perfect fit here. I'm going to go ahead and pull it off just so you can see. It's got that kind of squarish uh, shape to it. And uh, here's a closer look at it. So it's made for the Shure mics that have a, a more kind of squarish um, head as or grill as opposed to the round ball SM58 or even the Beta 58. Um, so looks like that. Okay, cool. Dave, I've been noticing many Sennheiser dynamic mics being used by reporters on the news lately. Anyone know which models they might be using? Um, I have used the MD... Is it 47? Uh, it's a handheld dynamic. Sennheiser MD... Or maybe it's a 46? I thought it was a 47. No, it's not 47. I don't remember those model numbers. I've only used it for one... Yeah, MD46. Let's go ahead and switch over to the Mac here. And I think this is the one that I've used here, the MD46. Um, so that's one model that I think you may be seeing. It's a, it is basically a reporter's microphone. Um, its characteristics are... Uh, let's see. Wow, that's very light on the tech specs there, Sweetwater. <laughs> um, I don't remember if this one is a cardioid or a super cardioid. It's a, it's definitely, a, oh, it's a cardioid. So it's a cardioid dynamic and um, 
it's good in terms of handling wind noise. Uh, we used it indoors at M at um, NAB probably the very first time I did interviews. Uh, my friend Scott Vanderbilt came out with me, and that's the mic. I believe that's the mic he had that we used, and we plugged directly into camera. He was using a Sony FS5, and we got some pretty good results with that. I was pretty happy with that microphone. So that's what I know. Others in the chat may have some other models that they have seen as well. All right. I was also wondering if you could talk about the metal tabs on the XLR inputs of the Mix Pre 10 II. They are really small compared to the ones on my F8N and therefore much harder. Um, let me just take a look. Yeah, on the F8, they have, they look something like this. Actually, I can go to the overhead camera. Let's do that. So you can see those are a little bit on the bigger side, but even on the, um, here's the F6, you can see they have the kind of smaller tabs. And those are the, they're similar on the Mix Pre as well. Let me grab a Mix Pre. So there's the Mix Pre. Yeah, they're not, they're, uh, they're definitely smaller and I think they're trying to keep them within the size of the body here. I will I will confess something here. I I generally prefer the Mix Pre's over the Zoom F series recorders. They're both good. Um, but the one thing I do, I would say at a high level, I think I do prefer the overall form factor of the F8 versus the kind of skinnier one here. It would allow for a bigger screen on the Mix Pre, which would be nice. And it would give you a little bit more real estate on the side as well here. So you wouldn't have to put these tiny little things. These get stuck on stuff. I get stuff, uh, if you've got stuff in your bag, sometimes I've had these kind of get, grab at them a little bit. So yeah, I agree. There's a little bit of a problem. But you go on to say, it's hard to push down at. Is this a problem for the rest as well? I'm thinking of getting short XLRs and just run them out of the inputs. I would recommend that actually. If you're in a bag in particular, um, I think that's going to make your job a little bit easier is having those short leads if you will in place and then therefore you know when you do the the uh, kind of the day-to-day -day or regular connecting and disconnecting things are a little bit easier that way so good thoughts all right For general information live for general informational live streams, do you think speech intelligibility is more important than sound quality? Except if you're doing voiceover for a documentary film. Um, I don't know why you can't have both. I would say yes, both. <laughs> if you can only choose one, of course, then intelligibility is going to be the number one. You you need your audience to be able to understand what's being said. Um, and I would I would caution against doing. Um, there are some beautiful voice recordings that have a lot of bass and they, it, perhaps too much bass. Hey, everything good over there? Yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would I would avoid going too extreme on anything like that because that can be really hard to hear in certain environments. If you have an audience that is going to be listening on their phone, in cars, trains, planes, things like that, um, maybe with earbuds, uh, yeah, they're going to need something that's more intelligible than anything else. So I think personally you can do both. Um, so just don't go extreme uh, in terms of pushing a lot of bass at it, trying to make things too rich. All right, Ike. Thanks again, Ike. Thanks so much for your help with the, um, with the H2R gear plans. That's been super helpful. Do you have some opinion regarding the use of the new Aperture 100X light compared to your fanless DNO bicolor LED panel? Seems to be a steal. Um, in live streams, I like to have fan, uh, lights with no fans. In fact, the DNO has no fan and that's the reason I use it here. I don't generally use it anywhere else. So it gets used as a key light right here above the computer screen. Um, back over here, bringing up the ambiance level in the room, it's aimed at the ceiling. I have a Lupo super panel aimed up at the ceiling. It also is in the mode, you can actually turn the fan off in that one, and then you're limited to 50% output. The hair light you're seeing right back here 
is also a Lupo um, smart panel, it's called, and it does not have a fan in it. And then, of course, our cool little ambiance uh, salt lamp right here um, has no fan in it. <laughs> so I just, just for live streams, I don't want to have any more fans in the room than, than are necessary. And right now we have fans in the computer, um, but we're, we're, these computers do too, but they're not on because we're not pushing them hard. And that's another thing is we don't push the computers hard. I don't want, like if you are trying to live stream from a MacBook Air, good luck. I don't think that's a, I mean, maybe some of you do it, um, but all the people I've talked to that have tried, it just taxes the computer so hard and the fan just goes nuts. Um, so, I mean, even in a MacBook Pro, you can get a lot of fan activity going when you're starting to do some heavy lifting, like, um, you know, encoding a live stream or running a Zoom call or whatever it may be. So be careful about those. So those are my thoughts on that. I, I think the 100D is great for uh, more produced types of pieces, and I'm really glad to have it. Um, I was actually surprised at how quiet the fan was on that one, at least the copy I have. The 200D had some problems and Aperture's working on those problems with that fan, but the 100D was pretty good. Uh, I was pretty happy with it. And we used it as a key light in the review video I did on Thursday. The 100D was the key light. The 200D was used behind a sound blanket <laughs> three meters from me, and it was uh, operating the, or it was shooting through the spotlight mount and making that pattern on the wall behind me. And um, yeah, that the the 200D unfortunately makes a bit of noise, but that that would be my main thought. The the another thing to consider as well is that the DNO is really nice because it's a panel, and the soft box that goes on it is only about what 15 to 20 centimeters thick, so it doesn't take up a lot of space. If you put a soft box on a 100D, even if you use the Light Dome Mini, you're you're taking up a lot more space. So you have to have more space to work with to make the 100D work. And that's the downside of that. But if you've got the space, it's a great light. And it's a lot, it's significantly cheaper than the DNO, actually. So good question. Thanks, Ike. All right, I'm going to change the lavalier mic that came with my Tentacle Track E. Would the Rode Pro one be good for general and musicians' voices? I haven't specifically tried that combination, but I don't foresee any issues with that. Um, it's a decent microphone. Yeah, it's a decent microphone. I uh, Does anyone else have opinions on that? I've, I've always found the Rode microphone to be decent. It probably needs some EQ in some cases, but uh, just like most lavalier microphones do. But I, I found it works pretty good. So that's what I would say on that one. Okay. Back to Greg, do you know of any dashboards for Mixer Mix Pre 10 to mount wireless receivers in? I've seen some for 6 series or 8 series, but nothing for the Mix Pre. Hmm, I haven't. Um, I have seen the there's someone there's a company that there's a small company that makes bags, mixing bags with a kind of modular frame where you kind of I try I don't remember the name of it. They might have something. Oh, caught me by surprise and I don't remember the name of that company but um, they were featured in the last um, sound summit that sound devices put on they had a little presentation in there where they talked about their sound bags they're really kind of they're basically racks um, and somebody in the chat may know what I'm talking about and, and bring it up but those those would be the closest I know of other than that Greg I haven't heard of anything so okay thanks Greg Hope everything's well. Hope you're uh, getting all as much rain as you need. <laughs> I think that the folks in Oregon would be happy to trade away some rain for now, and we'd be happy to take it here. All right, next up, do you have any experience with the Rogue Amoeba audio software like Audio Hijack or Loopback? Yes. Uh, my wife uses, um, she's been attending a lot of different online courses lately, and she uses Audio Hijack to record the audio from them. So that's the extent of my experience, but... Um, the general idea is that you can route audio from one app to another app and you can record it using Audio Hijack. You can apply effects to it and you can actually send the output of Audio Hijack to, another, to the input of another um, app that is able to do something else with it. So for example, uh, my wife uses it to record Zoom calls primarily, um, but I have heard of other people 
using it to, for example, um, capture the audio from their audio interface, apply some effects, and then route it over to Zoom or Microsoft Teams or something like that. So it's pretty cool stuff. Definitely a fan. That's everything? Okay. Oh, and we're 10 minutes over. Emma is giving me the, the evil eye. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for joining us for today's live stream. Um, hope you get out there and make some great sound, and we will talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.